Subcommittee on Regulatory Affairs, Stimulus Oversight and Government Spending will come to order. Um, I thought I would start today with the mission statement of the Oversight Committee, just to try to always remind us to what, we're, what our focus should be. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. Again, I want to uh, welcome all the Republican members who are here this morning. <laughs> and but great to have uh, you as part of the committee, and we will maybe introduce the rest of our team when they, uh, when they arrive. It is a busy day, as you all know, here on, uh, on Capitol Hill. And I am uh, also pleased to have as our ranking member Mr. Kucinich, a good friend of mine from, uh, from the great Buckeye State, who I have enjoyed working with on a number of issues over the uh, past two Congresses. So great, great to have you, as well as the ranking member of the full committee has joined us today. Mr. Cummings, we appreciate your presence as well. I will start with an opening statement, then we will have uh, uh, time for Mr. Kucinich's opening statement and get right to our great panel. Uh, unfortunately, as you can see, the, the two individuals we invited from the administration, um, former member of the administration, current member of the administration, have not uh, decided not to come. Uh, we think that is unfortunate, and we will talk about that a little bit later. Two years ago, the President signed the single most expensive piece of legislation in American history, more expensive than the entire Vietnam War or all the Apollo missions. An official report released in January of 2009 by the Office of the President-Elect and the Vice President-Elect made very specific promises for the stimulus. This record-breaking spending spree was supposed to keep unemployment under 8 percent, and by today it was supposed to be at 7 percent. Instead, of course, the unemployment rate has been at or above 9 percent for 21 consecutive months. In our State of Ohio, it has been higher than that for that same time period. 13.9 million Americans remain unemployed. But that doesn't tell the whole story. Over the same time period, almost 100,000 people have dropped out of the workforce in our State of Ohio. We now know the disappointing truth. The stimulus failed. It failed to meet the administration's goals for job creation. It failed to meet the administration's goals for growth. It failed to meet every meaningful performance standard, every metric of economic activity, basically every single market test of prudent public policy. Two years ago, the administration sold the American people on a long discredited Keynesian pipe dream that the Federal Government could spend our way out of a recession. Today, taxpayers are left with a larger national debt, compounding interest, and nothing to show for it except the longest period of record unemployment since the Great Depression. Today, we will hear some, from some of the world's foremost experts on fiscal policy who will assess the collateral damage to the Nation's global reputation, our economic recovery, and credibility gap between this Administration's lofty promises and the re real world consequences of failed economic policy. What we will not hear, however, is an explanation from the Obama administration, an administration, by the way, that promised unprecedented levels of oversight and accountability for this very bill, unprecedented, uh, unprecedented accountability indeed. It is unconscionable that the administration has refused to provide any witness who can account for the goal set forth for the stimulus when it was conceived. This level of instruction and defiance of the Congress does not reflect the values and vision for transparency and accountability the President promised on many occasions. When the stimulus was proposed to Congress, the halls of the Capitol were filled with administration officials lobbying hard for its passage. The charts and graphs and projections were everywhere. Members of Congress were told that the failure to pass this stimulus would result in prolonged recession, but that passage would be a boon to the growth. The American people were told that the President had the best economic advisors armed with the most reliable economic modeling to get the country back on the right path. But now the White House refuses to answer for the failure of their experiment with the American people's money. We invited two of the architects of the economic rationale for the stimulus to testify, testify here today, Dr. Christina Romer and Dr. Jared Bernstein. Both refuse to appear. We have given the administration the opportunity to discuss the stimulus in the context of the policy's original goals, metrics, and promises. Today there are two empty chairs where Dr. Romer and Dr. Bernstein should, have, uh, should be sitting. When an opportunity comes to explain the administration's position on the design and goals of the stimulus, no voice will be heard. The oversight of the stimulus is not about extracting a pound of flesh or scoring political points. This subcommittee, however, has a duty to the American people to seek to understand how the stimulus was conceived and why it failed, so that taxpayers are not subjected to this sort of economic misadventure again. 
The budget released by the President earlier this week reaffirmed the need for hearings like the one we are having today. The budget revealed that the Administration is unwilling to answer the mandate put forth by the American people last November, that they want Washington to stop wasting their tax dollars. The budget shows that spending will be, would be higher than it was in 2009 and 2010 we were in, when we were in the midst of the downturn. Federal spending this year will be $3.8 trillion and, com and comprise an astonishing 25.3 percent of GDP and result in a deficit of $1.65 trillion, the highest since World War II. Call it an investment, call it whatever you want. Our economic position is extremely fragile and we are in danger of losing the future. The longer it takes to get us on a pro-growth track, the worse off we will be. This hearing, in my mind, is the first step in understanding why the President's policies have failed, why doubling down with more spending and more borrowing will only result in more of the same poor results that has left our great nation in this precarious economic situation. With that, I would yield time to our distinguished ranking member, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, Mr. Chairman, good to be here today. Uh, I, I want to point out that um, in terms of the invitations, uh, that uh, your staff invited one private citizen, one public citizen, who were unable to attend today's hearing. Uh, I have been informed that the administration offered to provide two other high-level administration officials, uh, notably a Deputy Secretary of Commerce and a Deputy Assistant Secretary for Transportation Policy from the Department of Transportation. And I have been told that uh, your staff declined uh, and further said the administration didn't want to make anyone available to talk about the stimulus program. I just want to point out for the record that uh, two top administration officials were ready and willing to come today. And, and I, I think it is appropriate that we, we review the stimulus. I have no problems with that whatsoever. Um, my point of view is a little bit different. I think that the Recovery Act is too small. Uh, the economy is still fragile. We have an unemployment rate over 9 percent. Uh, the depth of the recession was greater than predicted. Those who argued that the stimulus package was too small accurately predicted the severity of the recession was much worse than any e economist uh, initially thought. The uh, Blinder Zandi report people critical of the ARRA's effect on job creation said, quote, critics who argue that the ARRA failed because it did not keep unemployment below 8 percent ignore the facts that, A, unemployment was already above 8 percent when the Stimulus Act was passed, and, B, most private forecasters, including Moody's Analytics, misjudged how serious the downturn would be. If anything, this forecasting error suggests that the stimulus package should have been even larger than it was. And the same report also notes, while the strength of the recovery has been disappointing, this speaks mainly to the severity of the downturn. Without the fiscal stimulus, the economy would arguably still be in recession. Unemployment would be well into double digits and rising, and the Nation's budget deficit would be even larger and still rising. So Americans need to get back to work, which means our government is going to need to continue to spend in order to increase demand for goods and services. Public spending is necessary to get us out of this recession. Uh, you know, we, gave, we gave significant tax breaks to the, to the private sector. And if the private sector hasn't used that to create jobs, if the money that went to Wall Street didn't use, uh, didn't cause the private sector to create jobs, then the public sector has a responsibility to create the jobs in order to uh, get us out of this recession. Uh, today, throughout the day, I will be pointing out that the, Repub the Recovery Act succeeded in avoiding a recession that could have been worse, that uh, there was an increase in GDP and job growth, that the stimulus impacted the recession quickly. And there, uh, according to Blinder and Zandi, it, there was a Great Depression averted. I, I want to point out that, um, uh, and, and I am not the only one who has pointed this out. As a matter of fact, there is a book that has uh, just uh, been released recently called The Great American Stick-Up. Uh, it talks about how Republicans and Democrats enrich Wall Street while mugging Main Street. So we are you know, we're, we're both here trying to clean up a mess that has actually been created by people in both parties. And when you look at deregulation, deregulation was a failed policy. You know, we have had a full committee hearing where we have people testify about the financial service industry was inadequately regulated for decades. And you have got somebody in one of the publications today uh, trying to um, uh, still discount rules on derivatives, which sets the stage for another boom-bust cycle. And then you have got to look at the war. Uh, CRS uh, uh, has a report that says the cost of the war for the last, uh, since Iraq and Afghanistan have come into our awareness, have been about $1.2, $1.3 trillion. 
Now, this administration has actually accelerated spending on Af in Afghanistan. And the Democrats, my party, accelerated spending in Iraq in 2007. Uh, both parties have responsibilities here. And, uh, you know, but the cost of this, w the wars are taking our ability to be able to do a budget. They're just, just destroying it. And, and when you consider now that we have more information about the war in Iraq being based on untruths, when we have more information about the corruption of the Karzai administration and, and the total loss and waste of American tax dollars, you see that there's policy changes called for that both parties are going to have to come together and do something about. And one thing that I have confidence in is that, uh, is that Mr. Jordan uh, and I uh, do have the ability to work together. We, we may not agree on, you know, on things, but we do have an ability to work together. And maybe this, this working relationship can create some circumstances where we can come up with some common sense approaches that will enable our country to get back on, on good footing. So I'm glad to be here with you. And let's, um, uh, let's go to the, the witnesses. I think the, uh, the gentleman, uh, I would just point out a couple things, this, uh, the, the, his comments. This administration has uh, certainly increased spending on everything. Um, th that is true. And, and again, uh, two deputy secretaries, uh, as offered as witnesses by the administration, I think just doesn't meet the test when you think about this being the most expensive piece of legislation in American history. We wanted the architects, we wanted the people who put it together, who who were the ones who understood the modeling and the reasons that they put the, the bill together. We wanted them here. And frankly, when you think about the mission of this committee, uh, it seems uh, very appropriate when we are talking about the amount of taxpayer money that was put into this legislation to have the folks who put it together come and testify. May, may I uh, you, certainly, respond briefly? Certainly. Uh, I agree with the gentleman that, uh, uh, that the gentleman as chair uh, has the right to ask anybody to testify. And, and I'm disappointed that the two witnesses were not available. On the other hand, some, they did offer replacements. Now, the replacements may have not been to your liking. I can understand that. Well, but I, I, I would, if, if the gentleman would yield, I, I, would, I would think the, the witnesses offered by the administration would not be to anyone's liking. It's not this, as, as the gentleman indicated, this, is, this should not be partisan. And in fact, the gentleman highlighted the, uh, some of the spending that was done in the past Congress, you and I both voted against the TARP right. bailout and some of the other things. We do agree on, on, on some issues. I would think Republicans and Democrats both would say the witnesses offered by this administration were not appropriate for a piece of legislation of this magnitude. I, I want to say again, the gentleman is correct in having the right to ask anybody that you think is important to be able to get the answers from to appear before this committee. That is that's just unquestionable. It is unquestioning. I am just stating that someone was offered and uh, they, they were turned down. So thank you. Okay. Uh, I thank the gentleman. Let us get now to our, uh, our distinguished panel. Uh, before that, members have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We will now, now recognize our uh, distinguished guest. We first have Professor John Taylor, Ph.D., uh, is the uh, Marion and Robert Raymond Professor of Economics at Stanford University and the George P. Schultz Senior Fellow in Economics at the Hoover Institution. I actually heard Mr. Taylor speak just a few weeks ago. Um, out in California, uh, and we are great to have uh, you with us today. Professor Ru Russell Roberts, Ph.D., is the J. Fish and Lillian F. Smith Professor of Economics Chair at the Mercatus Center and Professor of Economics at uh, George Mason University. And Dr. J.D. Foster is the Norman B. True Senior Fellow in Economics of Fiscal Policy uh, at the Heritage Foundation. It is the policy of the committee that all witnesses be sworn in before testifying. Um, so if you would please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answer in the affirmative. Thank you. And we will start with Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Ranking Member Kucinich, for inviting me uh, to speak today. My research on the uh, Stimulus Act of 2009 uh, shows that it had had um, no significant positive impact on the economy that we can measure. And indeed, I think the legacy in terms of increased debt and uncertainty uh, is harmful uh, for the economy. In my view, this really shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, research on previous types of discretionary countercyclical ac actions like this from the past, from the 70s, even more recently than that, uh, shows problematic results, if you like. Um, what I have tried to do in my written testimony is provide facts, provide what actually happened, rather than trying to simulate 
uh, models that about which there is considerable disagreement. When you look at the facts of ARRA, you see, according to the Department of Commerce, according to the Bureau of Economic Analysis, three main ways in which the money went out. And it is important to trace the money. Uh, first, uh, Federal government purchases of goods and services, including infrastructure. Uh, second, grants to the States uh, with the intent that they would increase infrastructure spending. And third, temporary transfer payments to individuals, such as a $250 uh, check sent out uh, last, in, in, last year in 2000, 2009, mainly. Now, when you look at these uh, carefully, uh, you see some really, I think, striking facts. First of all, a very small amount of infrastructure spending came from the Federal level. It is amazing. Only 0.04 percent of GDP went to infrastructure spending from the Federal level. This is by any measure immaterial and could not plausibly be a factor uh, in the recovery that is sometimes mentioned. Economists sometimes debate the size of the multiplier. It is irrelevant when the thing the multiplier is multiplying is so teeny. When you look at the grants to the States, of course, these were substantial. But you also look at what the States actually did with the funds. They did not increase infrastructure spending. And in fact, they didn't even increase purchases of goods and services as measured in the national income and product accounts. Instead, it looks like these funds were used to reduce the amount of borrowing and perhaps increase other kinds of transfer payments to individuals. Again, it just couldn't have had an effect based on what the data show. And then finally, the temporary transfer payments to individuals, which were substantial in magnitude. The purpose, of course, was to jumpstart consumption. People would spend this money. Uh, but when you look at what happened, they didn't spend the money. For the most part, it too was used to maybe increase saving, uh, draw down some of the debt, and reduce the borrowing. This was not was the way it was supposed to work. This, in fact, is what economics would tell you. Temporary payments like this do not stimulate consumption in appreciable magnitudes. We have seen that in the past. We saw that as uh, even back as short ago as 2008. Again, this is what one would have predicted. When I look at the, if you like, cross-checks of these data to see in the aggregate how much government purchases stimulated the economy, it is just there is no correlation between that and the recovery. Instead, you see private investment, you see net exports driving whatever recovery we, we have had. So when I look at this overall, it seems to me, looking at the data, looking at the facts, tracing where the money went in the aggregate, using data provided by the Department of Commerce, you see a very small effect, I would say even immaterial. And I would just conclude by saying, in addition to that, I think the, the legacy of the increased debt and, in addition, the tendency that the stimulus packages themselves had to distract people from dealing with the longer-term debt and spending problems that we have to address was also detrimental. Um, and I would be happy to answer any questions you may have, Mr. Chairman or the members of the committee. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Kucinich, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Over the last two years, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009 has injected over half a trillion dollars into the U.S. economy in hopes of spurring recovery and creating jobs. The results have been deeply disappointing. Job growth has been anemic, while our deficit has grown, limiting our future policy options. Fourteen million workers are unemployed. The unemployment rate among African Americans is over 15 percent. This is an American tragedy. What went wrong? Why were the predictions so inaccurate? There have been two explanations. One is that the economy was in worse shape than we realized. The only evidence for this claim is circular. The standard Keynesian models underpredicted unemployment. I prefer a simpler explanation. The models that justified the stimulus package were flawed. Those models were broadly based on the Keynesian notion that the road to recovery depends simply on spending. In the Keynesian worldview, all spending stimulates, somehow subsidizing university budgets in the Midwest or paying teachers in West Virginia helps unemployed carpenters in Nevada. That may be good politics. It is lousy economics. This isn't the first time the Keynesian worldview was wildly inaccurate in predicting the impact of changes in government spending. Look at World War II. 
We frequently hear from Keynesians and others that the military spending of World War II ended the Great Depression. Certainly, unemployment fell to zero because of the war. But did the war create prosperity or a boom? There was a boom for the industries related to war, but there was little prosperity for the rest of the country. The war was a time of austerity. Government spending didn't have a multiplier effect on private output. It came at the expense of private output. What about the end of the war, when government spending plummeted? Paul Samuelson, a prominent Keynesian, warned in 1943 that when the war ended, the decrease in spending, combined with the surge of returning soldiers to the labor force, would lead to, quote, the greatest period of unemployment and industrial dislocation which any economy has ever faced. He was not alone. Many economists predicted disaster. What happened? Government spending plunged from 40 percent of the economy to less than 15 percent, and prosperity returned to America. Unemployment stayed under 4 percent between 1945 and 1948. There was a short and mild recession in 1945 while the war was still going on, but the economy boomed when government spending shrank and price controls were removed. We are told that the failure of the current stimulus proves it simply wasn't big enough to get the job done. But it is equally plausible the opposite is true, that government intervention in the economy prevented the recovery. The truth is, our knowledge of the complex system called an economy as modern as the United States is woefully inadequate and may always remain that way. We ask too much of economics. Even our best attempts to measure the job impact of the stimulus make this clear. In November of 2010, a few months ago, the CBO estimated the stimulus had created between 1.4 and 3.6 million jobs, not a very precise estimate. But even this estimate was more of a guess than an estimate. The CBO estimates didn't use any of the actual employment data after the stimulus was passed. Instead, they based their estimates on pre-stimulus relationships between government spending and employment, relationships that failed to predict the magnitude of our current problems. The CBO's results and those of other forecasters using multi-equation models of the economy are not science. They are pseudoscience, what the economist F. A. Hayek called scientism the use of the tools and language of science in unscientific ways. So where does that leave us? Let's get back to basics. When you are in a hole, stop digging. Stop running deficits of over $1.5 trillion and counting. Act like grown-ups. Get your fiscal house in order. Stop spending 25 percent of what we produce. Stop wasting my money and giving it to your friends. Stop passing legislation that makes it hard to figure out what the rules of the game are going to be. Get out of the way. Make government smaller and give us a chance to do what comes naturally, seeking ways to make profit, avoid loss, and work together. That's the only, that is the only sustainable path to recovery and prosperity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Foster. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity for allowing me to testify before you today. At best, economic stimulus efforts based on deficit spending and tax cuts with little or no incentive effects have done no harm, at best. It is possible to stimulate the economy during and after a recession by improving incentives to work and produce, by reducing uncertainties regarding future policy, by expanding foreign markets for our goods and services. Recent efforts have been unsuccessful because they did none of these things. Regulations increased, uncertainty increased, tax distortions were left in place, and efforts toward free trade have been anemic. Stimulus can work, but has not worked because the administration took the wrong approach, emphasizing incentive neutral tax relief and massive increases in deficit spending. As he often remarks, President Obama inherited a ballooning budget deficit. His response to push the deficit higher, and with his most recent offering, he has reached new highs. Fortunately, the recovery is underway, uneven, stronger in some areas than others, but recovery nonetheless. The underlying strengths of our free market system are once again at work. But make no mistake, our economy is recovering despite, not because, of stimulus efforts. The heart of the administration's policy is the equivalent of fiscal alchemy. Alchemy is the art of transmuting metals, referring specifically to turning lead into gold. Fiscal alchemy is the attempt to turn government deficit spending, whenever, wherever, and on whatever, into jobs. Regarding near-term stimulus, it is not a matter of how wisely or foolishly the money is spent, nor how quickly or slowly, or whether some is saved or not. Any more than the phase of the moon or adding a bit more wolfsbane enhances the prospects for lead to become gold. 
The basic theory of demand-side stimulus is beguilingly simple. The economy is underperforming, demand is too low, increased demand by deficit spending, and voila, the economy is stronger and employment is up. One wonders, then, why government should not simply increase deficit spending much, much more and create instant full employment. Why indeed? The answer is that demand is shifted but not increased because government must somehow fund this additional deficit spending, and it does so by borrowing, reducing the resources available to the private sector. Suppose you take a dollar from your right pocket and put it in your left pocket. Do you have a new dollar to spend? Of course not. Deficit spending shifts demand from private to public sector. Or imagine the level of water in a bathtub represents the total level of demand in our economy. Now, suppose you pour a bucket of water into the bathtub you would expect the water of level to rise. But where did the water in the bucket come from? It came from dipping the bucket in the bathtub in the first place. You may make a splash, as the President did with his stimulus, but when the water settles, in terms of the water level, total demand, nothing has changed. There are some telltale signs that was, has intentionally or inadvertently fallen for demand-side stimulus alchemy. One involves talk of multipliers. One must first believe deficit spending can boost total demand, before investigating multipliers. One must first believe lead can become gold to investigate the advantages of incantations over potions. Another telltale sign is references to whether amounts are saved or spent. Whether deficit spending monies are saved or spent matters not a whit to the immediate level of economic activity. If spent, then private demand falls by the amount borrowed to fund the spending. If saved, then all that has happened is a shifting of portfolios. Government debt is higher, private saving is higher, but total demand is again unmoved. Support for demand-side theory often comes from observing that private saving might be parked in unproductive locations, and well it might. But unless saving is withdrawn entirely and held in cash, it remains part of the financial system, and banks and other financial institutions are lending those to somebody else to use. And if the saving is withdrawn and held in cash and out of a distrust of the financial system, then there's nothing about a government selling prodigious amounts of debt that is likely to reassure that fearful saver to put the saving back into the financial system for government to borrow. Because the budget today, deficit today is so enormous, the nation's policy options, aside from halting or reversing the regulatory onslaught, are severely limited, confined essentially to expanding free trade and cutting spending deeply to restore fiscal balance. Unfortunately, in his budget, the President punted, as the Washington Post, among others, opined. It is, therefore, up to the Congress to act. Near-term efforts to cut spending are essential, but must be seen as but the first step in a steady march against government spending, including reforming the major entitlement programs to stabilize these programs and to restrain government spending. The best fiscal policy now is to get the Nation's fiscal house in order by cutting spending repeatedly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank the witnesses. Uh, look, I think the American people are asking, when does this stop? I mean, I've been, I've been, saying, I've been saying for months, if big Federal government spending were going to get us out of this mess, well, for goodness sakes, we would have been out of it a long time ago, because that is all the government has done for two-plus years. And frankly, it did start even under the Republican, previous Republican administration. And it, as Mr. Foster pointed out, it has been taken to new levels with this administration. So I think instinctively, the American people understand the stimulus didn't work, uh, transfer payments, propping up states, bailing out. It, they know it didn't work. Um, but I also think they are beginning to realize that not only didn't it, it, it didn't work, it caused harm, as evidenced by the record deficits, record debt that, that we have in front of us. And frankly, um, I think as Dr. Foster pointed out and, and maybe our others as well, um, I still remember the, the first principle they teach you in economics class, this, this crowding out concept or opportunity cost. When you take resources and devote them to one thing, by definition, they can't be used somewhere else, frankly, the more efficient private sector where they can't be used. So I think the American people get it. My question goes right to where Dr. Foster left off, so we will start here and work backwards, is this budget, as I begin to look at it and delve into it that the President unveiled on Monday, I think continues the same pattern. It is the same old, same old. It is big government spending. It is now a record deficit on top of a record deficit on top of a record deficit. Um, so give me your thoughts on this, this budget and, and, frankly, the tax increases and the spending in, contained in it, how harmful that is going to be as we, again, try to get below 10 percent unemployment, get back to a, nor, uh, a more normal economy and, and, frankly, a growing economy. We will start, Mr. Foster, and work backwards. I think this budget, uh, if it were enacted, 
uh, would be extremely harmful to our economy for a number of reasons. One, it is an enormous increase in the national debt with a deficit uh, projected at $1.6 trillion, finally breaching clearly the 10 percent of our economy level. Uh, this is creating more and more uncertainty as let, to let me interrupt. And are you? Are you, you I, I think this pretty common consensus. You got to be at three percent of GDP or below. I would argue below that, frankly, at, to to have any type of sustainable deficit that you're carrying. Would you agree? Depending on the rate of interest, a normal, a long-term rate of interest, something in the order of two and a half to three percent is sustainable. Okay. We are well beyond that. Exactly. Uh, and, and oddly, we are in a situation we where we are far more irresponsible, frankly, than all of our European friends who recognize the situation they are in, the stimulus that they employed didn't work either, uh, and they are now embarking on a strenuous uh, program, a painful program, of getting their spending under control and their deficits under control because they realize that that is the key to short-term and long-term prosperity, short-term because these deficits are creating uncertainties. Uncertainty is the enemy of prosperity. Well said. Well said. Dr. Roberts. Sorry. The reason that uh, uncertainty is the enemy of prosperity is we need investments, and investments require risk taking. And if the future is uncertain and people are nervous about the future and have anxiety about it, they are less likely to take risks. We have done a bunch of things in the last three years, four years, to reduce the incentives for risk taking. And worse, the risk taking we have encouraged has uh, been imprudent. We need prudent risk taking. So we have the uncertainty about the deficit, the fact that future tax increases are coming. Uh, but we don't know how that's going to be, the nature of that burden, how it's going to be financed. We have uncertainty about the stability of the system itself. We're financing our deficit right now with very short-term interest uh, okay. uh, borrowing, which is great when interest rates are low, but when interest rates rise, it could be very, very expensive, and I'm very concerned about that. There's regulatory uncertainty. We've passed massive re regulation of the health care and financial sectors, two large parts of our economy. It would be one thing if we passed the legislation that was in place, but, of course, the rules aren't written yet. So how do people know to, take, yeah. to go forward? And finally, we have done a bunch of bailouts that said if you are bad at what you do, we are going to give you money anyway. Yeah. And so risk-taking, prudent risk-taking has been discouraged. Let, let me, you, you made me think of one thing here, too, let, and I will we'll finish with Dr. Taylor. Maybe he can address this question, too. And this is one area where we, we may have some agreement with the President. We, corporate tax rates. I mean, actually, and to the point where I think it is, frankly, unpatriotic not to be for lowering the corporate tax rate when you, when you think about where we compare with our competitors around the globe. So I would like your thoughts on that, too, as, as you evaluate the budget, Dr. Taylor, in the last 30 seconds here. Yeah, sure. I, I think uh, the most sensible thing is to re re reverse this spending binge of the last uh, two, three years. And I think that's, that would be so beneficial mm -hmm. to the economy to show the courage of our government to be able to do that, we start reducing the debt. I think that ta on the taxes, I agree that corporate taxes makes us uncompetitive. I would say the firmest thing to say to convince the American people is we are not going to increase anybody's tax rate for the foreseeable future. That would provide certainty, re re remove a lot of the doubts and concerns people have about investment. And, and the only way you are going to get unemployment down is to encourage private investment. That is what the data show. That is what history shows. Well said. Thank you. I yield to the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, I, I thank the uh, gentleman. I have some questions for uh, Professor Taylor. But before I begin, I just want to make some observations here. To have this discussion about the state of the economy without getting into the fact that the tax cuts that were sponsored by the Bush administration cost us $1.2 trillion, that the wars, which both parties have participated in, have cost us roughly about $1.2 trillion. We have a trade deficit right now of $497.8 billion, according to uh, the latest U.S. Census, NAFTA, GATT, China trade, millions of jobs have been lost. It has been the work of both parties. We have a, maybe close to 15 million people unemployed. And when you look at the boom-bust cycle that was created by um, the lack of regulation of over-the-counter derivatives, that where Warren Buffett himself 
in 2002 condemn these over-the-counter derivatives as financial weapons of mass destruction. This is uh, as uh, recounted in uh, Bob Shear's book, The Great American Stick-Up. When you, when you look at the $700 billion bailout, when you, when you, which Mr. Uh, Jordan and I both voted against, when you consider that Wall Street is recovering and Main Street is not, that stock prices are going up, but the regulations that need to be in place to stop another boom-bust cycle, it is still pretty shaky as to whether we will be able to avoid that. I, I, th I think that you know, the testimony that we have here is very interesting, uh, but um, maybe you don't even have enough time to get into this, but it is inevitably incomplete. Yeah, we have to have a complete picture of how we got to where we are, and, and it has to be really not driven by partisanship, which, which I don't see my uh, colleague here as a very partisan person, but it has to be delivered. You know, we have to fo focus on the facts. Now, Professor Taylor, your testimony concludes with these statements. Many evaluations of the impact of ARRA use economic models in which the answers are built in. And you also say that, quote, uh, uh, you also say that approach makes less uh, use of simulations of existing econometric models, although it uses general theories such as the permanent income theory or similar theories of government behavior. Now, Professor Taylor, earlier this month, Dartmouth economist writing for the National Bureau of Economic Research published a paper, which I, I moved to uh, put into the record without objection, uh, that, that found a positive effect of the stimulus on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, the authors acknowledged that their approach probably understated the effect, although it was non nonetheless significant. Uh, Professor Taylor, is it your testimony today that the NBER uh, analysis of the stimulus was erroneous because, as you said, many studies had the answers built in? The NBER study you are referring to, I do not know. Well, we're going to, I want to make, I want to have no, well, let staff. me answer with respect to my own studies of this specific, and also NBER publication. Well, well the, you know, here's and this they is show, the. They show that when you look at where the money went, it did not increase infrastructure spending at the states. And so it's very clear in the data. Well, I, I, I can say that uh, as far as the infrastructure spending as a percentage of the ARRA, uh, that uh, I would have preferred the development for infrastructure, but it wasn't. Uh, however, uh, this NBER paper is, in fact, critical of your work. And uh, what the authors wrote were other model-based uh, evaluations, such as Kogan, Quick, Taylor, I think they are referring to you, and Weiland, conclude that the government spending multipliers are significantly smaller than those claimed by advocates. Again, their conclusions are based entirely from existing models and gain nothing from the actual data, I want to stress that, from the actual data on employment before and after the implementation of the ARRA. Uh, so isn't, you know, isn't it true that much of your testimony here today uh, would be subject to, to criticism from these authors, which in fact is the same criticism you no. make against others? I just like to see economists arguing. No, no. Well, I can uh, answer. No, no, it doesn't apply to the, what I, I testified about today. It applies to other work that I have done in the spirit of simulating models. And my whole point of this testimony is to go beyond the disagreement about the models and look at what actually happened. And that is what I am doing. And I think it is uh, very clear when you look at the data. And I couldn't agree more that you have to go beyond the models. Well, well, let me ask you this. Would, would, you, have, uh, would, would you have said, let's say, uh, all $787 billion should have gone into infrastructure spending, or would it be your position we shouldn't have spent anything in trying to simulate the economy? It is a matter of what actually government can do. Um, why do you think such a small amount went to infrastructure at the Federal level? I think people were told you just can't get the money out the door that fast. Instead, the idea was to send grants to the States, but not thinking that they are not going to get money out that fast either. It is a matter of what is feasible and capable. In our experience, not just in this case, but in the 1970s, we tried to do the same thing, send grants to the States, hoping that they would spend money on infrastructure. They didn't do that. They did exactly the same thing as this time. Mr. We didn't look at those Mr. studies. Mr. Chairman, are we going to have another round? Then I will get back to this question. Well, Thank you, Dr. And if I could, uh, Mr. Taylor, is it, is it true that the uh, actual data shows that unemployment has been at record levels uh, for, the, for the last 21 months when it was projected to be at 8 percent? Yes. This okay. Thank you. The Vice Chairman of the Subcommittee, the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Chairman Jordan, and thank you all for being here this morning for this very important discussion. I always thought it was just a bit counterintuitive that we would take a trillion dollars out of the private sector and give it to the government 
to, to redistribute back to the private sector with all sorts of strings attached and hope that it would uh, help our economy and job creation. So um, I guess my first question, I will just um, refer to something that um, the gentleman from Ohio mentioned regarding the tax rates and continuing the tax rates and what they add to the deficit, because that is something we hear as a, uh, an excuse or a reason not to extend the, current, the tax rates from 2001 and 2003. I would like you to comment on that before we get into the stimulus a bit. So the, the, I think the agreement to extend the tax rates uh, that were in the law currently is, is a very important stimulus to the economy. Uh, economics tells us the more permanent changes like that, la something that has been in the law for a while, it does, is much more beneficial until people's spending decisions and investment decisions. I would like to see that extended even further. I think that would be quite, quite beneficial and a good stimulus, uh, more beneficial than the, than the, than the uh, temporary types of changes people have proposed. Thank you, Dr. Shelley. Dr. Roberts? Well, I think it is important to remember that tax, we cut tax rates, and that had a stimulating effect that uh, Professor Taylor was talking about. But if you cut revenues and you don't cut spending, all you have done is substitute taxes tomorrow for taxes today. And I think the single most important thing that Congress can do now is to cut spending, because that is an implicit tax on the private sector. We spend way too much money through the government sector. We need to spend less. Thank you. Dr. Foster? Uh, I agree with Dr. Taylor that uh, it is terribly important that we uh, extend for a much more uh, longer period of time, if not make permanent, the tax relief that was enacted under President Bush. Uh, that uncertainty about the outcome of that policy had a major depressive effect on the economy last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and those decisions will feed on into next year. It, it reduced investment, which is going to be a driver going forward. Uh, but it is also terribly important to get the spending down now. Uh, that is probably at this stage the most stimulative policy that we can enact to get spending under control, the deficit down, reassure credit markets that we do intend and will get our fiscal house in order. Thank you. My next question, and it is to all three of you again, um, do you think that the, con the economy would have improved and would have um, recovered without the stimulus? Dr. Taylor? Uh, yes. I, I think the, in fact, the beginnings of the recovery uh, preceded the stimulus. When you look at the factors in the economy that drove the increase in growth, there are, there are private investment, uh, also net exports, not really the government purchases. So very much so. I think that, in, in fact, at this point in time, you can point to the stimulus and related reasons for the higher debt as, as holding <coughs> back the strength of the recovery at this point. We, we, it has been disappointing, especially last year. We hope it is picking up. But I, I think it would have been better without this kind of a stimulus. Thank you. Dr. Roberts? The only thing I would add to that is the um, funneling of money, Federal tax money, to the States encourages their misbehavior. I think it is extremely important that people who live beyond their means uh, learn to change their behavior. And we continue to enable that, and we just push off the day to, of reckoning down the road. I think that is irresponsible, and um, I think we ought to be changing those incentives. Thank you. Dr. Foster? As I testified, I believe we could have enacted stimulus that would have helped, but the President chose a different path. He chose a path that was not going to be effective because you do not add money to the economy by first taking money out of the economy, and that is the fundamental flaw of the theory. And thus, I think, on balance, we would have been better off. At best, this policy did no harm. At best. Thank you. Uh, and I am sure we will get to this. My time is um, soon to expire. Uh, I would like to hear from all three of you regarding what your recommendations are to, to grow our economy and to really get at the root of this problem. What can we do as a Congress to help improve the economy of the United States? The three things, and this is before the stimulus, first is to make sure we are not going to increase tax rates. Uh, it is, is not necessary to do that to deal with the deficit, and it would be beneficial to growth. Second, uh, lay out a plan to get the debt explosion over with. We have projections by CBO of debt just skyrocketing. Lay out a plan so they score it to come back down to reasonable levels. That will be reduce uncertainty, give people faith back in our government. And, um, and third, I think it is important to address this spending binge we have had recently. 
spending going from 21 percent to 25 percent of GDP uh, and, and not really coming down very much is something that should be addressed. And that will stimulate the economy because the jobs come from the private sector. Thank you. We can maybe thank continue you. those. Uh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Now turn to the distinguished uh, ranking member, the gentleman from Maryland. I want to thank the uh, chairman for calling this hearing. And I want to thank our witnesses uh, for doing an outstanding job. Uh, as a member of the Joint Economic Committee, we have had Mr. Zandi up here, Mark Zandi, who was the advisor to uh, John McCain, Senator McCain, when he was running for President, uh, come and testify before us. And he uh, testified and acknowledged that the Recovery and Reinvestment Act had, had a significant effect on the economy. And he said something else that I found very interesting. Um, he said that, you know, a lot of people think economics is, you know, a science where everybody is going to agree. He says you are going to have some disagreement. Um, but I find that I must tell you that it concerns me when I have a chorus of folks saying all the same things. So I, I just want to ask a few questions and I'd just like the uh, yes or no answer. And, Dr. Taylor, you talked about the facts, just the facts. Uh, and I, I, I want to go to some of the facts and see what you all think of this and the things that we do know, okay, the things we know. Um, and I just want a yes or no answer on these. And then if I have time, we can come back and you can explain. Uh, over 75,000 total projects have been started across the country under the Recovery Act. Have they had any positive effect, yes or no? Yes or no? Just yes or no, and I'm going to come back and let yeah, you explain. I'm sure, I'm sure some of them have a positive effect, but it's a, the question. Uh, okay, I got a, not a I got a, I've got seven questions. Okay, in the, right, okay. I'll come back to you. I promise. Yes or no? A little bit. Yes. Okay. Uh, Surely, Dr. Forster. On net, no. All right. More than 110 million, or 95 percent, of working families have been receiving a boost in their paychecks each week through the Making Work Pay tax credit. Has this had any positive effect on these families, yes or no? Okay. Yes. On the family, certainly. All right. Almost 70,000 small businesses have received nearly $30 billion in loan assistance through the stimulus. Has that had any positive effect on those businesses? Yes. Yes, on those businesses. Keep your voices up. Let's hear you hear nice <laughs> and loud. Your testimony was loud. Come on, Dr. Forrester. Uh, yes, on those businesses. All right. Under the Recovery Act, more than 2,800 loans to farmers and ranchers were guaranteed. Has that had any effect on the farmers and the economy? Mr. Taylor. I haven't studied that. Okay. You haven't studied that? Sir, I, I'm sorry I didn't hear you, sir. Uh, so I have not studied. Uh, okay. You've got to keep. I, okay. Uh, I have not studied those particular. I understand. No, you, didn't under, you didn't study it. Dr. Roberts. I'm sure it was good for them. All right. But not doing on the economy, right? I don't know. All right. I'm not going to say yes or no to that. Okay, fine. And you, uh, Dr. Foster? On those farmers, yes. On but not on the economy? economy? No? That is correct. All right. More than 300,000 families have uh, made home improvements to reduce their energy use and cut their utility bills. Uh, will those uh, families be able to appreciate any results from the Recovery Act? And does that affect the economy, the fact that we are putting people to work to do those repairs, like in my district? And districts of almost every single member of every single member of Congress, by the way, uh, Mr. Taylor, Dr. Taylor, I'm sorry. On the overall economy, no. Okay. On the individuals, yes. Uh, Dr. Roberts, now go ahead. Which projects are those? The home improvement. Yeah, that, home improvement. Is that the yeah. insulation and the weatherproofing? B weatherproofing, yeah. uh, retrofitting. Incredibly badly run program. Very ineffective. Uh, so you're saying it had no effect on the economy, or it had not a positive effect overall? Good for the people who work doing it, but uh -huh. not for the rest of the economy. Uh, people that the 15 percent that uh, you talked about, African American unemployment rate. As a matter of fact, it's higher in some instances in my yes, district. Sir. But there are people who I just witnessed doing those jobs, having a tremendous impact that would, that would not have been working but for. Perhaps. But you said, say, no effect on the economy? Perhaps they might not have been working. It is hard, no, it's it's a, hard to no, know. No, they would not have been. Believe me, I live there. All okay. right. Well, I am glad for them, then. All right. That is great. Uh, Dr. Forrester, how about you? Uh, on the economy, no effect. For those families, I can't judge their decisions. I presume they made wise decisions for themselves. The Department of Housing and Urban Development has rehabilitated over 409,000 homes and built 5,700 new homes. 
will, will the families who reside in those homes experience any benefits from the Recovery Act, and does that affect the economy in a positive way? The individuals who benefited from that are benefiting. The overall economy, no. Ditto. You are going to ditto, too? I am going to ditto. You trying to move it along. We have got a great chorus here. Trying to help you. Under, under the Recovery Act, more than 4,000 Department, and this is my last question with the indulgence of the uh, Chair, 4,000 Department of Defense construction and improvement projects have been started at over 350 military facilities. These include the construction or improvement of military hospitals and 25 uh, child development centers. It also includes over 70 military uh, family housing improvement and construction projects. Will these projects result in benefits for anyone? Does it, do they affect the economy or did they affect the economy in a positive way? Uh, we will start with you, Dr. Forrester. In the aggregate, no, sir. Yes. Don't know. Good for them who got the money. If you pay people to dig ditches and fill them back in and you give them up $200,000 a year salary, for example, they will be very be they'll be better off. And you, Dr. Taylor? Those people benefited the overall economy, did not. Thank you all very much. I thank the gentleman. Let me, uh, let me just clear up one thing, we'll, and we will go quickly. We just got four. We will go one more round, then we will get to our second panel. Um, I want to just clear up this, this issue. Some have suggested that allowing families and individuals to keep their money <coughs> adds to the deficit. And, and I just fail to, fail to adopt that premise that reducing the tax burden on the American people somehow adds to the deficit. But I want to hear it from the experts. Do our deficits and the buildup of our national debt, is that a result of letting people keep their money or is it a result of politicians spending too much? Let's just answer the simple question first. Mr. Taylor. The largest amount of the, is the spending going forward. It is just basically you just look at projections of why the deficit is where it is, where it is going, why it is increased. It is on the spending side. <coughs> Mr. Russell. Mr. Well, Robert. I just want to have the thrill of saying I agree with Mr. Kucinich a little bit. So, um, while I agree that the stimulating effect of cutting tax rates has a positive incentive for economic activity, to cut taxes and increase spending at the same time is irresponsible. I wonder. Uh, I heard your you first, gotta first do, comment. You've got to do both. You would stay there. Okay. You've got to do both. Okay. Well, let, let me, uh, Mr. Foster, and then I, I want to follow up with another question for all of you. Well, obviously, as an arithmetic matter, the deficit is the difference between spending and uh, revenues. But if you look at where we are spending as a share of our economy, which is a simple metric, compared to any historical norm, we are far above that, indicating that that is the problem. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. I, I would argue the problem is so big. Deficits were running, record deficits, piling up $14 <coughs> trillion dollars in, in, in debt, so big that we, we have to get after the spending right away. But to ultimately deal with this thing, You've got to have economic growth. There is no way you can you can get to a balanced budget, get to the get this ship headed in the right direction, get to where we need to go if you do not have economic growth. And allowing the private sector, allowing families, small business owners, individuals to keep more of their money, I contend, is central to having economic growth. And I would argue lowering the corporate rate as well and, and regulatory policy. I get all that, but I would argue uh, keeping those taxes low, allowing families to keep more of their money, is fundamental to getting the economic growth we are ultimately going to need to dig ourselves out of this mess. And I would like I, to I agree. My, my proposal and recommendations is to not increase tax rates and to deal with this deficit and debt problem by reversing the recent spending binge and getting spending back to where it was as a share of GDP. Okay. Let me ask you this then. And would you agree that where the, the continuing resolution is, um, would you agree this is a good first step in, in, in saving the taxpayers? Uh, approximately $100 billion over the rest of this fiscal year is, is the, yes, a good I start. Yes, getting, getting spending back to 2008 is the excellent first step. Okay. Dr. Roberts. But it is a baby step. You need you got to take a bigger step. Yeah. It is one fifteenth of the deficit. It is a rounding error. It is a deck chair off the Titanic. I mean, it is just nothing. I get, uh, it. I get it. But but I think, again, if you want to cut taxes, the way you want to do that is cut spending. I believe with what I agree with what Milton Friedman said. What is important isn't how we finance what government does. What is important is what government does and how much of it. Because of this basic point, spending leads to borrowing, which is just another which is form more of taxation. Which is more future taxes. Right. So if you right. cut taxes, especially if you don't cut tax rates, you just give people money back and you continue to spend, you haven't encouraged economic activity. You have told people we are going to take money out of your hide later. Well said. Well said. Well said. Mr. Foster. I think there is one area in which economists have a broad consensus at this point, whereas it is. 
and that is that economic growth is the driver for deficit reduction above all. Uh, the key to economic growth, as the President himself has said, is the private sector. And the way to get the private sector moving forward at this point from a Washington perspective is greater certainty. Don't raise taxes. Certainty about tax policy. Suspend the regulatory onslaught and get spending under control so they have some ability to forecast what government is going to be doing. Yeah. L let me just finish with one, one last point with you. Earlier you said, uh, Dr. Foster, that um, there was a stimulus package that, that could have been put together that you actually thought would make some sense. Describe that for me. Was it, as I suspect, was it the right kind of tax policy, right kind of tax cuts, and some infrastructure spending, or was it something else that you had in mind? Uh, it certainly wasn't infrastructure spending. Okay. As, as Dr. Taylor pointed out, you can only push so much money out that pipeline, and in the end, it wouldn't have made any difference to the immediate uh, economy. Uh, a, an effective policy which would have been effectively no cost would simply be to say at the beginning of 2009, we will not raise taxes. We will not raise taxes until the unemployment rate gets down to full employment, and we can have a debate about mm -hmm. what tax policy should be. If we had simply done that and eliminated the uncertainty about tax policy, our economy today would be a lot stronger. So you are arguing that the best stimulus package at the time, early 2009 when we were in the, the midst of this, this, this problem, the best stimulus approach at the time would have been to establish certainty, but in essence do nothing? The best no-cost policy. Yeah. If we were willing to use resources, the best policy would have been to take whatever we otherwise would have spent in, in this stimulus law and use it to reduce the corporate tax rate, which even the President now acknowledges must be done. Great. Thank great point. Thank you. Go to the ranking member. It is really mystifying to hear witnesses extol taking the uh, wraps off the private sector when you consider that the reason why we went into the dumper was because you had the Financial Modernization Act passed, which permitted which basically took down the Glass-Steagall firewalls, which separated commercial banking from invested banking, investment banking, and permitted this over, the avalanche of over-the-counter derivatives, the black box uh, investing that went on that created the crash that we had. And now we are saying, well, if only the private sector, read Wall Street, can have its way again. Look, they already took the country over the cliff once. I think we ought to be in a position here where we at least recognize what happened so that we don't let it happen again. I don't know if any of you gentlemen ever testified in favor of the Financial Modernization Act or the Commodity Futures Trading Act, but if someone doesn't do any back analysis and understand that Glass-Steagall actually protected capitalism from itself through having regulations. We have got to be careful here advocating that we just take down regulatory structures because in the end the taxpayers end up fitting, uh, you know, footing the bill. Now, I, I was interested to hear the, um, I, I think it was uh, Dr. Foster, I was in a discussion with staff, but I, heard, I think I heard you say if you, um, uh, if you cut tax and increase spending at the same time, it is not responsible. Did you say that? No, sir. I believe that was Dr. Roberts. Okay. Thank you for pointing it out. So Dr. Roberts said that. Uh, I mean, I, I, I heard that, and I, I, I thought, well, I was thinking about the Bush tax cuts. And these tax cuts helped to dig the economy into a bigger hole. They took the tax burden off the shoulders of the rich, put the burden on the middle and lower classes. The rich won, the economy lost. In 2001, the tax cuts were enacted. Uh, CBO, estimated the gradually rising Federal budget surplus. This is before the tax cuts were enacted. They estimated the gradually rising Federal budget surplus. And CBO forecast a surplus of 5.3 percent of the GDP in 2011. That was 10 years from the time they, they made the first uh, analysis. The 10-year, $1 trillion price tag attached to the cuts played a direct role in making the forecast a pipe dream. The Bush tax cuts that were enacted in 2001 and 2003 resulted in one point $2 trillion revenue loss from the fiscal year 2001 to fiscal year 2010. So, so I, would, I, I would tend to agree that if you, um, if you are cutting taxes and increasing spending at the same time, you are going to get in trouble. I would argue that the tax cuts set the stage for putting us in a position where it limited our ability to spend within the con con uh, within a construct of the current way that we handle our money. 
Now, I want to throw one other thing into this discussion, Mr. Chairman. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution of the United States puts the power to coin money solely in the hands of the Congress. We basically gave that away in the 1913 Federal Reserve Act. You've got the Federal Reserve with the power through quantitative easing to just print money. Somebody here talked about alchemy, about, you know, which is basically you're talking about you know, creating something of value basically out of nothing. Yeah. Um, all the money the Fed creates is backed by the full faith and credit of the United States of America. Congress is basically cut out of that deal. No, no limited, if any, oversight. We can't even have transparency and find out what they are doing. So, so I am thinking that, um, that when we start to address issues like the economy and when we start to you know, attack uh, the ARRA as being somehow at the epicenter of this whole thing, please, <laughs> it is almost laughable because this, you, know, you have to talk about tax cuts, the impact. You have to talk about the war. You must talk about the trade deficit. And if we are really going, and, and to look at it from what happened under both parties to be able to really get to the bottom of what is going on in our economy. So I would say, you know, I have seen your testimony, and I would say that all of you have something to contribute to this. But uh, there, there aren't any high priests or priestesses when it comes to, uh, to the economy. I, I remember sitting in a committee with Alan Greenspan, who was the, the, the final arbiter in this town, or had been, on the economy. And here is what he said I made a mistake in presuming that the self interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, were such that they were capable of protecting their own shareholders and their equity in the firms. Now, if the best of the best gets mystified in this town, you know, who are we? I just say, let us look at some facts here. And, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for holding this hearing because it is the beginning of what needs to be a long and serious discussion about not only how we got here, but where are we going and how can we get people back to work. Without objection, I would like to put in the, how the Great Recession was brought to the end by Zandi and Blinder. Without objection. Um, it is ama an amazing day. We got Dr. Roberts, who agreed with Mr. Kucinich. We got Mr. Kucinich coming full circle, agreeing with Ron Paul right here in front of all of us. Uh, uh, it it's <laughs> an, my it's buddy. A, it's an amazing, uh, amazing day. <laughs> Uh, did you want to say something? I just want to say uh, two quick things. When Alan Greenspan said he made a mistake, I think he was right. But the mistake he made was helping Wall Street socialize its losses of my money. And I am in favor of the private sector leading the, the recovery. And that would rule out Wall Street, which has been cushioned by Federal welfare from the chair of the Federal Reserve going back to, and the Congress going back to 1984. So the single most important thing I think we need to do to get that straightened out is to stop bailing out losers on Wall Street, well which said. we have done systematically, and it's a huge problem. Well said. I, uh, I did think you say he was, this is our witness? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's, uh, well, we are both in agreement with uh, that statement, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member. Yield to the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. And I think to go full circle, I'm actually going to say that I agree with the ranking member on one thing that he has said, and that is both parties has, have brought us to, uh, to this brink of catastrophe that we're at. And, and it's one of the reasons that I ran for Congress is, is because I, I don't think this is a Republican problem or a Democratic problem. It's an American problem. And, and we've had um, a complacency and irresponsibility here in Congress for far too long. And now, where I do disagree with it, and, and I think what happens is that when, when you have um, what I used to call in my legislature the, the wing tip, or some people call it the wing nut coalition, where you have the left and the right, where they end up meeting at the same time, what ends up happening is that we reach a different conclusion. We both agree on the problem. We agree that that we have been ir irresponsible, but we reach a different conclusion. I think all of you said that it is irresponsible to lower taxes and increase spending. But it seems that some people on the other side say then the conclusion is that we should increase taxes and increase spending. Um, and I think that is extremely irresponsible. I think what we should be doing is decreasing spending, decreasing taxes. But I have a question. The Tax Foundation has found and they are talking about state level, so I want to, you know, I have studied their, their state information. At the Federal level, would it be smart for us to look at some of the exemptions that are out there? Because I, I do think we need to reduce the corporate tax. In fact, I would like to just zero it out. But at the same time, there are a lot of exemptions that are out there that are, uh, you know, 
pretty much picking winners and losers in the economy, and, the, and I, think, I don't think the government is very good at that. What would be your take if we start, yes, reducing corporate tax rates, but at the same time looking at some of the corporate exemptions that are out there? I think a tax reform of that kind uh, makes a lot of sense, uh, reducing rates, if you like, and, and broadening the base by looking at uh, exemptions and loopholes. I would, though, at this point in time say, to me, the problem is really on the spending side. And if you could get some kind of a consensus just to leave tax rates where they are for the time being, that would create certainty and, and remove a, like a cloud that people think taxes are going up rather than down. So I would focus on what is what's feasible at this point, and uh, although the, it would be better to do the kind of reform you are talking about, I would be very happy to just leave rates where they are and work on this terrible spending problem that we have. So, so even not reducing the corporate tax rate? Well, I would like to do that, but you have got, got to get something through this system okay. here. And, um, and it seems to me the spending is, if it, that can help you on the spending side, if there is a tax reform like that that can help, and, and that may indeed be the case. But I would say that, that to me, you know, in two th the year 2000, spending as a share of GDP by the Federal Government was 18.2 percent. It is now 25 mm -hmm. or so. That is a gigantic, gigantic gap to get fixed. Mm -hmm. uh, spending, uh, tax rates, tax revenues, when we get back to normal, will not be that much different. Okay. If I could get an answer from the other. Well, you know, the big issue here is that the corporate income tax should be zero. Mm -hmm. Most economists would agree that it should be zero. And the reason isn't because we should give money to corporations. It's because corporations don't pay the corporate income tax. Mm -hmm. Consumers do. It's a hidden tax, and it discourages investment and risk-taking. So tax simplification is a good idea. Broadening the base is a good idea. And the, but the big problem you have is that giving away money is more fun than <laughs> not giving it away. Mm -hmm. And that's, that political challenge is what you have to face. So I think it would be uh, wonderful if we could reduce the corporate tax rate, but with budget deficits as large as, as they are, uh, that is problematic. Uh, the President has called for revenue-neutral corporate tax reform, which philosophically I agree with. It is very difficult to figure out exactly what loopholes you ought to get rid of and which are intrinsic to a corporate income tax base, but that is an uh, important discussion. Where we are today, however, is an economy that is struggling to recover. And if we start on a road of corporate tax reform, that means businesses don't know what tax system they are going to operate, be operating under. We just managed to create yet another source of uncertainty, in this case a source of uncertainty intending to do something good. But we have to understand that this new source of uncertainty will have a depressive effect even while we sort through the process of corporate tax reform. Thank you. I have one more question. Um, and, and I apologize that I, I went out of the meeting. Um, maybe you already answered this question, but I think it was Dr. Taylor who said that we didn't spend enough money on infrastructure, or we, there was just a little bit amount of money of GDP spent on infrastructure. If we would have spent the entire amount on infrastructure, um, would it have made a difference? Because it seems that's what I keep hearing from the other side is that we just didn't spend enough. Yeah, of this, of this, I think incredibly large package, 862 or however you want to measure it, uh, a very small fraction went to infrastructure. Remember, it was advertised as mm. spending, create jobs with infrastructure, so such a small amount went to it. I think it's, that's the reality of these packages. That's what we found in the 70s when we tried this. You can't get money out the door that fast. It's just not, you can maybe accelerate sp spending that's already there, or the permit's already approved. That is what I would have done. I would just focus on accelerating some of that spending. But it is just not feasible. And so that is really what, why these packages, one of the reasons why these packages fail. Okay. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. The gentlelady from New York is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the uh, gentleman from Maryland who has since departed but talked about a chorus here this morning, and indeed it is a chorus, but it could be uh, we could have the Sopranos here if the administration had agreed to show up. So unfortunately, we are only getting one side of the argument. Um, I would like to just briefly, before I get into this pro-growth uh, that we have talked about, what we can do to help the economy, just can you tell what either one of the three of you the approximate number of Americans who have lost jobs with the stimulus since the stimulus uh, plan was passed? It's a, a, approximately uh, six million extra 
uh, unemployment workers because uh, not because of this, but is at the same time had occurred since the uh, since the depths of the recession. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. We we talked about reducing spending and the need for this Congress to to really pay attention and to, to and as you mentioned, start with the hundred billion dollar in the CR that cut. What about if we uh, we've You've heard the other side talking about tax rates and the need to increase taxes because of their what they do to the deficit. You all said that's not so. If we can keep tax rates permanent, hopefully extend those rates permanently, what a good effect that would have. What about if we reduced those tax rates? What if we did what Ronald Reagan did and and got those tax rates down for Americans? What what do you see? What effect do you see that having uh, in terms of a pro-growth approach to uh, how we are going to get this economy turned around? Well, I would say very briefly, if, if you are able to reduce marginal tax rates, to uh, stimulate entrepreneurial activity, to, to stimulate uh, creation of jobs that way, that is beneficial to economic growth. Uh, you, you do, there at that point, have to think about spending, however. And as, uh, as uh, my colleague Russ Roberts indicated, I would say that you know what, what a goal would it would be, and it seems to me feasible, and the American people would like it if they understood it, would just be to return spending to where it was in the year 2000 as a share of GDP. That's that's less than 19 percent, and so that gives you lots of opportunities to. I think reduce tax rates of the way you're asking about, but you really got to be sure that you're able to bring some kind of a consensus around. It is not going to happen right away to, to bring spending down to those levels. It was fine at that point in time. Uh, what was so, was so bad about spending levels at 2000 levels? And so I think that would be the way I would look at this, focus on the spending. I just make the point that uh, I think, as, as John pointed out, uh, tax revenue right now is about 14-something percent of the economy, tax revenue, and we are spending 25 percent of the economy through the government. Now, which is the tax rate? Is it 14 or is it 25? It is 25. It is 14 today and 11 tomorrow down the road. So I know I keep it is a dead horse, but you got to get this, get this horse to life. You, you, if you want to encourage incentives and risk-taking and investment, you got to get the government having a smaller role in the economy and give some oxygen in the room for the private risk-takers. And when you say that, and you, you talk about, and Dr. Foster mentioned as well, creating certainty for businesses. And we heard that throughout the, no matter who you talk to, especially small business owners, we don't know what's going to happen with the health care bill. We don't know what's going to happen with the financial regs. We don't know cap and trade. Fortunately, that stalled in Congress. Um, so those kinds of create uncertainty. What can we do? in addition to extending the tax rates permanently, to create certainty that sends a message out to the private sector, we want to help you. We don't want to get in your way. We don't want to impede your success. You need, don't just need certainty. You need confidence in the future, right? And that is why I think responsible budget cutting signals to the world and to the entrepreneurs here in America that we can act like grownups, that when we want more of something, whether it is the war in Afghanistan or some other program, we are going to cut something else back. That is what families do. When we act irresponsibly, we tell the world we are not going to be, we are not acting like grownups. Thank you. Dr. Foster, do you? you know, implicit in the massive budget deficit that we have today is the uncertainty about what Congress is going to do about it. Hmm. What taxes are they going to raise, if any, to close that budget deficit? What spending are they going to cut instead? If we don't know which they are going to do, they don't have a certainty about the outcome of that policy. So the budget deficit and reducing the budget deficit is part of gaining the certainty we need. That is an activist policy towards certainty uh, that uh, will be very helpful to the economy. And uh, we haven't mentioned it today, but another area of tremendous certainty or uncertainty that has been created that is going to unfold in the coming years is Obamacare. Now, we can have health care debates till the cows come home, but the simple fact is from a business's standpoint, not knowing what the regulations are going to be, that they are going to be fundamental in changing that marketplace, you can't make investments. You can't hire because you don't know what your circumstances are going to be. This creates a regulatory freeze on businesses. We can debate whether it was a good policy or not, but one thing is certain, this was not a good time to be imposing this kind of uncertainty on businesses who are being asked to invest because they are confident in the future. Thank you. 
Thank you. I want to thank our, our panel, uh, distinguished panel, for your time and for staying for a second round. We really appreciate uh, you being here today. You have been very helpful. We are going to move right to our second panel, uh, hear testimony, and so if the staff could get that set up um, for them, we will we'll go as quickly as possible, listen to testimony, do one quick round of questioning of the second panel. I want to thank the gentleman for um, joining us. Our first witness is Mr. Andrew Bush, is the Global Currency and Public Policy Strategist for BMO Capital Markets Investment Banking Division. Mr. Alex Brill is Research Fellow at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. Mr. Mr. Chris Edwards is the Director of Tax Policy Studies at the Cato Institute. And Dr. Josh Bibbins is an economist at the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, it is policy of the committee to swear our witnesses in, so we will do this again quickly, gentlemen, if we can. Do you solemnly swear, or if you will raise your right hand, do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show that witness answered in the affirmative, and we will start with Mr. Brill. We will just move down the line again. Thank you, Chairman Jordan and Congressman Kucinich and other members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to appear before you this morning to speak on the stimulus bill. Its two-year anniversary presents an appropriate time to evaluate the legislation's effectiveness. There are many metrics by which one could assess this massive Federal policy, but in my testimony today, I will focus on just two, overall cost and, quote, shovel readiness. For better or worse, the ARRA was enacted because majorities in the House and Senate believed that a large fiscal stimulus could make a positive contribution to the economy by stimulating aggregate demand. Under that premise and the assumption that the stimulus bill spending was not completely offset by a decline in private activity, the effectiveness of the legislation depends quite simply on the stimulus spending occurring in a timely fashion. My testimony this morning, I would like to emphasize three points. First, we should recognize that the bill was rushed through Congress at a blazing speed. H.R. 1 was introduced on January 28, 2009 and signed into law on February 17. A hodgepodge of policies ranging from high-speed rail to health information technology to home weatherization, hundreds of pages and thousands of projects. Second, the official cost estimate of the stimulus bill has varied over time, but always underestimates the true cost. Key to securing votes for final passage of the bill in the Senate was to reduce the final cost to $787 billion. Since that time, CBO has re-estimated the cost of the bill, once as high as $862 billion and currently to be a cost of $821 billion. But all of these estimates fail to include the additional costs already in excess of $60 billion incurred when Congress extended certain portions of the bill. In fact, I would note that President Obama's fiscal year 2010 budget included items to make over one-third of the stimulus bill permanent. Third, and most importantly, the stimulus bill has done an extremely poor job at actually spending money in a timely way. Regardless of your view about the multiplier effect, the economic factor by which an injection of fiscal stimulus could, at least in theory, result in more activity down the line, the bill could not possibly be effective or cost-effective if the money is not spent in a timely fashion. While certain activities did occur quickly, such as additional checks to Social Security recipients or unemployment benefits and transfers to the States, none of these policies constitute the much-touted shovel-ready activity and the, quote, reinvestment 
that, the legislat that was the heart of this legislation. For example, the Department of Energy should never have been awarded a single dollar in stimulus funding. At the end of calendar year 2009, they had spent only 5 percent of their allocated funds. At the end of 2010, two-thirds of the Department of Energy's funds remained unspent, roughly $22.5 billion. Department of State, FCC, NEA, NSF, USAID, and the Corporation for National and Community Services have collectively spent only 37 percent of their funds as of last December. At the end of 2009, they had spent collectively only 8 percent of their funds. Even the Department of Transportation, which was supposed to be ground zero for shovel-ready projects, have at the end of 2010 spent 56 percent and have nearly $20 billion left to spend, billions more from other departments. In my written testimony, I detail examples of, pro I detail examples of programs that have, two years after enactment, spent only 2, 3, 4, 9, and 10 percent of their available funds. In conclusion, while labor markets in the U.S. economy remain weak and a robust recovery has yet to materialize, the worst of the recession is long over. If the stimulus bill was ever appropriate, and I think it was never appropriate, it was in 2009, not in 2011, and certainly not in 2012 and beyond. I urge the Committee, given its jurisdictional responsibility, to continue to investigate carefully the causes that have resulted in this bill, which was intended to be timely, targeted, and temporary, to be implemented so slowly. Too much money was put into this bill in the first place. Too little of it was spent at the time the economy was the weakest. Clearly, government is not good at fiscal policy to turn the economy, and I hope the Committee's work will help dissuade future Congresses from repeating these same mistakes. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Burrell. Mr. Bush. Uh, Subcommittee Chairman Jordan and Ranking Member Kucinich, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to appear today. I, I was born in Ohio. I just was there recently and, free, and frequently speak. Uh, I was at the City of Guyana. They had an economics briefing there recently. So it is always great. It is always great to be in front of fellow Ohioans. Um, I just want to, I want to share my views regarding the uh, American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009, specifically the results two years after the enactment on the economy and the financial markets. Um, as you may know, I am the Bank of Montreal's global currency and public policy strategist, and I have worked in the financial markets since 1984. So my role is to analyze factors influencing the financial markets and provide guidance to our clients uh, on the potential outcomes of policy. I have had the distinct pleasure of writing commentary on a daily basis since 1999 and wrote throughout the financial crisis of 2008. So reform and oversight of our nation's programs to create economic growth and financial stability are, are critically important, obviously. Uh, Bank of Montreal thanks you, Mr. Chairman, and all the, committees of the, uh, all the members of the committee for their upcoming work on these topics over the next two years. To reclaim its position of financial and economic leadership, the United States needs to understand the short-term and long-term impacts of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2009. So for the financial markets, um, ARRA uh, Act was at best an economic disappointment, at worst a potential fiscal disaster. In the fall of 2008, the economy and the financial markets were in the midst of turmoil generating from the failure of Lehman Brothers, the Federal Government takeover of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and the collapse of the subprime loan markets. This created an environment of fear and uncertainty in the financial markets that led investors pulling out of their funds out of risky assets and placing them into the safe havens of Treasuries, U.S. Treasury securities. By the end of 2008, both the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the yield on the U.S. 10-year note fell by nearly 50 percent. This extreme panic led to spreads between U.S. Treasury securities and other market securities such as high yield, investment grade debt, and large bank debt to widen significantly and rapidly. As an example of the panic, the commercial paper market nearly froze completely when the primary reserve fund broke the $1 barrier. At this time, many large corporations lost the ability to fund themselves using this critical market. The entire financial system appeared to be at risk of seizing up was in, and was in need of stabilization. The economy was deteriorating rapidly as businesses were unable to either receive credit from their bank or tap the debt markets for funding. One of the key questions before President-elect Obama and the incoming Congress was how to stimulate the economy in the most efficient and timely way. 
In late December of 2008, the financial markets reacted positively upon hearing the news that a large stimulus package was being discussed and debated in Washington, D.C. At that time, the news flowed varied from a package between $500 billion to $700 billion, which included tax cuts and new spending programs. Contributing to the market optimism was the description of the package by then-chair nominee-designate Council of Economic Advisor Christine Romer and Office of the Vice President-Elect Jared Bernstein. This is the job impact of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Plan. So in their report of January 10, 2009, Romer and Bernstein laid out their findings of ex and expectations for economic growth for a $775 billion program. It is critical to understand that the market's expectations for economic and employment growth from the plan were raised due to these findings. They estimated that the aggregate effect of the recovery package on Q4 2010 GDP would be to increase it from $11 trillion odd to $12 trillion, $2.2 trillion. Um, they stated the effect of the package would increase GDP by 3.7 percent and increase jobs by nearly 3.7 million. They went on further to predict that the plan would make the unemployment rate 7 percent by Q4 2010 from the 8.8 percent that would result in the absence of the plan. The, author, the authors predicted a 678,000 increase in construction jobs using calculations and estimates of effects by industry by economist Mark Zandi. The, the, his report was the economic impact of a $600 billion fiscal stimulus package, uh, Moody's.com, obviously, in November of 2008. Um, since the housing sector was a key variable in the financial crisis, the return of jobs to this sector was particularly optimistic and appealing to the markets. And at that time, there were many factors influencing the financial markets. However, this outlook was a contributing factor towards the rally in the U.S. stock markets that took the Dow up almost 13 percent in December. Subsequently, the markets became skeptical of the predicted outcomes by Romer and Bernstein. As newspapers, bloggers, research began to break down the sections of the plan, the costs of the plan, the pot and the potential increase in the fiscal deficits. Um, the, the sovereign United States credit default swap price rose from 20 in October to 59.7, a stunning 300 percent increase. So the honeymoon for the stock markets was over, and they slid until March. Uh, when Federal Reserve Chairman appeared on 60 Minutes and stated that no major financial institution would fail. Gentlemen, so I will just submit the rest to and, and thank you. Um, move on. No, I appreciate that uh, testimony, Mr. Bush, and uh, we'll, we'll, you can finish up when uh, we get to questions. Mr. Edwards. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member, for allowing me to testify uh, today on uh, the stimulus from Federal spending. There has been a huge increase in Federal spending over the last decade under President Clinton from 18 percent to 25 percent uh, today. Sorry about that. Uh, part of that, of course, was the $800 billion stimulus, which sadly, I believe, was a very costly Keynesian policy failure. And note that the, the amount of Keynesian stimulus in the economy in recent years wasn't just the $800 billion. It was the total amount of deficit spending in recent years, half a trillion in 2008 and about $1.5 trillion for the three subsequent years. So that is about $5 trillion of, of uh, so-called Keynesian stimulus, and yet we still got very high unemployment and a, a, a recovery that is more sluggish than in previous, uh, uh, previous recoveries. Uh, now, economists uh, continue to debate you know, how much of a sort of a sugar high you can get from this sort of Keynesian stimulus in the short term. There is no doubt in the long term uh, that this will damage the economy. Uh, why? Because all that government spending reduces uh, private spending. And there are two basic reasons, uh, causes uh, of damage caused by the spending. One, you are transferring resources from the more productive private economy to the less productive uh, government sector of the economy. And there is all kinds of evidence for that. We have got a website at CatoDownsizingGovernment.org. We go through every department. We talk about the various failures of all the, all the programs. But secondly, the transferring money from the private to the public is not costless. It causes what economists uh, call deadweight losses, the extraction, the forcible extraction of the funds from the private sector through taxation causes these deadweight losses. So, for example, President Obama Let's say he wants to spend $10 billion more on high-speed rail. The cost of the economy is not $10 billion, it is $15 or $20 billion. I mean, Martin, Martin Feldstein says that there's a, uh, you know, every dollar the government spends causes $2 of private sector damage. 
The, ra the sad reality is the United States is not a small government country anymore. OECD data shows us uh, total Federal, state, local spending now at uh, 42 percent of GDP. In my testimony, I show uh, that ratio over the last couple decades. The United States used to be substantially lower than other OECD countries. The gap has been closing. And I fear that we are just going to become another sort of stagnant European welfare state uh, if we keep all this uh, spending going. Let me jump quickly to uh, state and local spending, because a big uh, 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 you know, stated cause for the stimulus package was to help state and local governments who uh, were struggling with the recession. We have been bombarded with news stories uh, in the last couple of years about how state budgets have been supposedly devastated and radically slashed. The reality is really different, and I have got Department of Commerce data in my testimony that shows state, total state and local spending has not been cut at all through the whole recession. It rose rapidly from 2000 to 2008. It was exactly flat 2009. started rising again 2010. Uh, total state local spending uh, was at, as a share of the economy was actually up over the last decade. So despite two recessions this last uh, uh, decade, state and local spending is actually higher than it's ever been. So there is a real state budget crisis, and that is ahead. As you know, there's a, the bond debt has been growing rapidly in the states. They've got huge pension and unfunded health care uh, obligations. But here's a key point, I think, from, from a Federal policymaker's perspective. The states are in radically different positions with regard to their budget gaps, with regard to their bond debt. Some states like Nebraska have virtually no borrowing, no bonds. Other states like Massachusetts have, have a huge amount of borrowing. Uh, pension obligations, some states like Ohio, very high uh, unfunded pension obligations. Other states, it is quite low. So the states are in radically different positions here. And I think this is one of the problems with sort of Federal bailouts and Federal aid is that it is very unfair and I think bad economics to punish the well-managed frugal states uh, for the benefit of the poorly run and spendthrift states. So on the one hand, I am not for Federal bailouts, but as a, as a last sort of point, you know, the, the Federal Government has um, continues to impose lots of costs on State governments, most recently with the, the health care plan, before that with the No Child Left Behind um, laws. All those regulations and costs are poured down onto State governments, which I think is bad economics and also unfair. And, uh, and that is the end of my comments, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. <clears throat> Dr. Bivens. <clears throat> Uh, I would like to thank the Chairman and the members of the Committee for inviting me today. Um, we are going to start with a, a quick overview of the origins of what we now call the Great Recession and the rationale for the Recovery Act, and then just provide a little bit of overview of my assessment of it. Um, sometimes the origins of recessions are hard to see, not so with what we call the Great Recession. Between 1997 and 2006, the real price of homes roughly doubled. They had been roughly stable for almost 100 years before. Because the stock of housing in the U.S. is enormous, this added greatly to the wealth of American households. And housing wealth and the debt associated with it, as well as the huge activity in the home building sector, was the foundation for, for the 2000s business cycle. Um, this was obviously unsustainable. Home prices fell by about 30 percent between 2006 and 2009. This erased about $7 to $8 trillion in wealth from American households' balance sheets and consumer spending, just as predicted, predicted by a long range of economic theory and evidence, uh, collapsed. Home building collapsed. Residential investment took about three percentage points off GDP as home builders realized they had built too much during the 2000s. Um, these initial shocks to spending then cascaded throughout the economy. Businesses stopped investing because customers weren't coming in the door. Why would you build another factory when the factory you have is producing output that's not selling? Um, and so essentially, the economy suffered a shock to aggregate demand. I mean, to deny this, to say that that was not the essential problem, I mean, you have to answer the question then, why did almost 9 million people lose their jobs in a two-year period? American workers didn't wake up January 2008 with no skills. American factories didn't become obsolete in a month. American managers didn't forget to how to organize production. We didn't suffer from an inability to supply goods and services. We suffered from an inability to demand them. And to be clear, I'm using demand in the economist way, desire backed by purchasing power. Purchasing power was gone. It was erased by the housing bubble. And so by most measures, the shock to private sector spending caused by the bursting housing bubble was bigger than the one that led to the Great Depression. We didn't have a Great Depression mostly because we now have a central bank that leans much more aggressively against private sector spending shocks, and we allow budget deficits to rise to finance public spending to stem the gap caused by retreating private spending when you enter recessions. It was a big reason why we did not see the economy spiral into a depression. Um, ARA was part of that pushing back against the shock to private sector spending. And in my judgment, it worked largely as advertised. We have a Gross domestic product is probably about $500 billion higher today than it would have been if we had not passed it. We probably have about 5 million full-time equivalent jobs that we would not have had had R not passed. And th this judgment is based 
on three considerations. I mean, first, virtually all private sector forecasting firms, people whose money depends on being more correct about short-term economic trends, say that R added a lot to output and employment. Um, second, these effects are in line with what research says you should expect from doing something like ARA in an economic environment like we have seen for the past couple of years, very high unemployment, very low interest rates, very low inflation. Um, when one looks at research that says fiscal support cannot help the economy, it invariably is looking at the wrong episodes. Like the previous panel talked about looking at the 1970s and World War II, government spending didn't help. Well, it wasn't supposed to help in those episodes. You did not have very high unemployment along with very low inflation and very low interest rates in those episodes. When you look at episodes like what we have seen for the past two years, fiscal support works. Um, third, the timing was right. Um, basically, GDP contracted at about a 5 percent annual rate in the nine months before the Act was passed. It grew at roughly 2 percent in the nine months, I am sorry, contracted at 5 percent before it was passed, grew by 2 percent in the nine months after it. Same thing for employment growth. Um, and then also, contrary to a lot of what has been written, it, it helped arrest the decline in consumer spending. And that is exactly what you would expect, given the two-thirds of the Act was tax cuts and transfer payments to individuals. Lastly, just a couple of words on, on the really easy debating point deployed against ARA, the sort of ritual trotting out of the Romer Bernstein forecast. Um, you know, an earlier panel said you know, that the people who say that the Romer Bernstein forecast was wrong just because they underestimated how bad the economic shock was said there is no evidence for that. You can't prove it. Of course you can prove it. You can look at what economic forecasters were saying at the time. And I actually had a, a figure, I am not sure if we were able to blow it, out or blow it up or not, it is in my testimony. It shows the consensus blue chip forecast for what was going to happen in that sort of six month period in late 2008 and early 2009. The blue chip consensus was GDP would contract by 1.5 percent. It actually contracted by closer to 5 percent. That gap between the blue chip forecast of what was going to happen and what actually happened equals about two percentage points of unemployment. In short, the difference in the forecast in Romer Bernstein for what actually happened versus what they forecast to happen with ARA is because they followed the consensus forecast about the underlying health of the economy. It does not affect their estimate of how effective ARA was. Um, we would have, have about 3 to 4 million fewer jobs had we not passed ARA, and the fact that they underestimated the degree of the private sector spending shock that was hitting the economy in real time doesn't affect that. Um, so essentially, I think the Recovery Act worked largely as advertised. I think the biggest problem with it, its boost to the economy is gone. I mean, by the first quarter of 2011, it is adding zero to economic growth, and yet we still have 9 percent unemployment. Thank you. I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank the uh, gentlemen <coughs> excuse me, for their uh, testimony. Let me start with um, Mr. Brill. I was uh, intrigued by your comment that whether you embrace the multiplier effect um, doctrine or not, uh, it seemed to me your testimony's conclusion was it really did, doesn't matter because the bureaucracy was so inefficient at actually allocating the dollars, moving the dollars out, that that was a problem as well with this stimulus bill. Am I correct? And you, can you elaborate? Th that is correct. Um, ad admittedly, some dollars did move quickly. Uh, things where you simply needed to print a check um, or transfer funds, um, those payments uh, did occur. Um, relatively quickly, and it is noted in my testimony. However, the, uh, an enormous percentage of the dollars, and when we think about enacting legislation and the cost effectiveness of that bill, um, that legislation, an enormous amount of the money uh, was delayed. It was delayed because, quite simply, uh, the government, um, while it is good at spending money, uh, turns out not to be very good at um, spending it very quickly. Uh, so there are uh, numerous departments that have engaged in large, complex projects uh, that require permitting, consideration, um, architectural designs and other things. And, and to get those dollars spent, um, it will take years. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that was understood at the beginning. That doesn't make it okay. Um, of course, CBO did note that, uh, that this bill will have uh, budgetary effects throughout the decade. Um, but what we see at this point is how many programs have, uh, have really yet to even begin. Mm -hmm. Right, well, and and it, and frankly, there's a there's a continuation of them in the budget proposal that we got Monday from the president. I mean, I, I think of one example that jumps in my mind this this so-called high-speed rail, which I think is just not effective, not where we need to go. Um, but there's a continuation of this in, in in the current budget. Absolutely, a number of policies. I, I'm less familiar with a, this, a specific review on the current policy, all, current budget. Although high-speed rail is a, is a perfect example um, from the budget that pr that came out uh, um, in conjunction with the stimulus bill, over a third of those policies, um, the 
President asked to make permanent. In other words, he was ceding in the bill long-term permanent policy, spending policies. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Brown. Mr. Edwards, <clears throat> I was intrigued by your testimony, too, when you got into the, the States and the different situations they faced. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate, because when I look at what some States are doing versus the, the, the choices made by others, uh, the most obvious example to me right now is, is New Jersey versus Illinois. New Jersey, where the Governor came in and said, we are not going to raise taxes, we are going to reduce spending, and we are going to try to create a climate which I would argue is conducive to economic growth, versus what they are doing in Illinois, which is raising taxes significantly. Um, can you elaborate on, on, on the, the kind of the choices being made there and those, those two models or those two, um, the, those two decisions by governors and the legislatures in those states? Right. I mean, uh, you know, we, we do have a federal system. The states, you know, should be allowed to go in their own direction. Right. That's great. And that's one reason why I, I don't like uh, the federal intervention downwards, either spending or regulations, because I think it stifles with, uh, good diversity in the states. We want the states to try different things with their education systems and investment in all kinds of uh, uh, stuff so that hopefully, you know, the, the, uh, if, if New Jersey is moving ahead with uh, public sector union reforms, that is great. It can, it pr can provide a good model for other States. Uh, so I like that diversity. Uh, but it is also true that the Federal Government imposes a lot of these costs, like with the, mm -hmm. with, with the health care law and the No Child Left Behind law, that I think are really, uh, uh, really damaging. Yeah. Mr. Um, um, Bivens, I want to give you a chance to participate here as, uh, as well. Um, so I if I understood your testimony, it is basically it would have been worse had we not done what was, uh, what was done in 2009. And, and you know, obviously, I disagree. I think much of the panel disagrees. Um, and I would argue, just based on the stated goals of the authors of the policy, um, who, again, failed to be with us this morning, we didn't meet the goals they said. And, you, and I understand your, your comments near the end of your testimony. Well, they were using faulty data or data that wasn't up to speed at the time they made the decision. But the idea that we are going to spend $800 billion of taxpayer money and the promise was to keep unemployment at a certain rate and it would be even lower today, um, I still am struck by the, I, I guess I still reach the same conclusion that I think, frankly, most Americans have reached, which is the only thing we got from, this, from the stimulus was three years of record deficits and the highest, you know, highest level of national debt we have ever experienced? Well, I would say what, what the real promise of the Romer Bernstein report was, that we would have three to four million more jobs than the economy would have produced had we not done it. Um, and, and that one, I, I think their judgment is right and that is supported by, say, the CBO and, and other forecasters. And, and just one, one other point, too. I mean, just between December 2008, when they wrote that report, and March 2009, the month after R was passed, the economy lost 3 million jobs in those three months. I mean, that is essentially that 2 percentage point unemployment gap between what they predicted and what happened you know, right there. The fact that they did not realize that they were sitting on sort of an exploding private sector economy around them, you know, I, I think it doesn't speak greatly of their economic forecasting ability, but nobody got that in real term. Yeah. But that does not change the effectiveness of the policy or their, their evaluation of it. Yeah, well, and that is my point. I mean, they were pretty darn specific in the number of jobs that would be uh, where, uh, well, excuse me, I will say it this way, where employment would be. They were specific down to 137.6 million people employed. They, 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 they were so at least you would be critical of the fact that they made these specific projections. At a minimum, you would be critical of that. That is right. I would be more critical that they, didn't, that, that they took the blue-chip consensus as a given and as a good forecast when it clearly wasn't. Okay. I don't think they were trying to break any new ground in forecasting. I think they were just trying to take off the shelf, you know, these are reasonable things. People will not argue with this forecast. And the thing they grabbed that people would not argue with turned out to be very wrong because, you know, frankly, most of the profession was caught very yeah. flat-footed by how bad the recession was. L let me just Can I make a comment on that? Yeah, quickly? and if I give you one quick question, Mr. Mr. Bivens. Um, Mr. Bivens, as, a, as an economist who, is, who supports the stimulus, um, if you were involved in putting this together, uh, don't you think, I mean, would you be, uh, wouldn't you want to come in front of a panel on Congress looking at your work product and defend it? Sure. I mean, yes. Obviously, the stakes for me are a lot lower, so I don't know how, how, how it would have turned out if I had been an architect of it. But, <clears throat> yes, I, I think there is ample reason to defend the, the stimulus package on its merits, and yeah. I think it should be done. Okay. Mr. Edwards, then I will move to Mr. Kucinich. Mr. Uh, uh, John Taylor had a very good paragraph in his written testimony where he basically said, you know, the problem with a lot of these macro models is that they assume the results that, you know, the, the, the results are assumed, they are programmed in. So if you have a Keynesian macro model 
and you have a big increase in government spending, the result is already baked in the cake that you are going to get GDP larger. This is, and he says this is true with the, both the CBO model and Mark Zandi's model and other sorts of models. I agree with Russ Roberts that we should be very suspicious of all these macro models. Frankly, they are, they are wrong time and time again. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, the, and the model to look at, frankly, is what happened. Right. I mean, that's the, the best evidence is, is what actually took place, is look at the facts. Yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. We will go down to five minutes for uh, the Ranking Member, Mr. Kucinich. Uh, just building on what uh, Mr. Edwards said about the macro models, uh, Mr. Chairman, the, um, the Romer Bernstein report was released a month before the Recovery Act was signed into law. And what is interesting is that they had a qualification in this report. I want, you to, I want to quote it to you. Quote, it should be understood that all of the estimates presented in this memo are subject to significant margins of error. The uncertainty is surely higher than normal now because the current recession is unusual both in its fundamental causes and its severity. So they qualified what, what they were saying. I think it is important that we, that, that we know that since you know, we are focusing on, on that report. I, I also want to say, in uh, relationship to what Mr. Brill said uh, about high-speed rail, I think it would be important for this committee to, um, to look into the relationship between the uh, between commerce and uh, and transportation's role in increasing the efficiency of commerce or, or not, I, I think it's very important that we get into that. So so we don't just reject out of hand certain um, approaches that could actually end up helping the economy. And I, I think high speed rail is one of those uh, discussions we ought to have. Now, Dr. Bivens, in your written Fair testimony, uh, I, I have to get this question to Dr. Bivens, but thank you. Uh, Dr. Vivens, in your t written testimony, you state that private sector macroeconomic forecasters are in near universal agreement, unquote, about the positive impacts the uh, ARRA has had on uh, gross domestic product growth and unemployment. We know that the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office agrees. We know that private economists like uh, uh, Mark Zandi agree. Uh, we know that organizations like the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, as well as your organization, uh, the EPI, agrees. Can you explain why so many forecasters agree about the positive results of the stimulus? Yeah, like I said quickly in my, in my testimony, I mean, it is in line with a long line of research that looks at the efficacy of fiscal support provided to economies that look like the U.S. economy today, characterized by very high unemployment, very low rates of inflation, very low interest rates. When you provide fiscal support in an environment like that, the research shows that it works very well. Um, <clears throat> and I will say one thing, this, this idea that the results are baked into all these models, that is actually not true. These multipliers are not taken from the air. These multipliers are come out of the data. One, people look at the effect of fiscal support done in environments like we have today. They look at the historical record. They say, when you provided this fiscal support, when unemployment was high and inflation and interest rates were low, what happened? And you use those multipliers estimated from real data. They are not plucked from the air. Well, well uh, you have characterized the Recovery Act as small relative to the economic shock it was meant to absorb. Uh, if the stimulus was larger, do you think the unemployment rate would be lower than it, uh, is, than it actually is today? Absolutely. And what step does Congress need to take, in your opinion, to get more Americans back to work? Um, I, I think it needs to look at those parts of the, the Recovery Act that worked very well and, and continue or expand them. And so for example? Unemployment insurance, the fact that that has been extended for another 13 months as part of the tax cut deal, that is a very good thing. It is going to support a lot of jobs. Um, I would look at some of the other safety net programs. Food stamps are very good economic stimulus, let alone. Well, well, explain why that is. Um, essentially, the, the goal of economic stimulus is to get money spending quickly throughout the economy. And people who get food stamps and people who receive unemployment insurance are, by definition, people who are cash-strapped. They are not going to sock it away in savings. They need to spend it on you know, necessities in the here and now. And so the money circulates through the economy very quickly. Um, I would also say I think the infrastructure spending, which has taken a, a bit longer to get online, but that is actually a good thing. I mean, we have 9 percent unemployment today. The idea that we have missed the boat on infrastructure spending, helping the economy if a project rolls out next month, we haven't missed the boat. We are going to have very high unemployment for a very long time. I mean, the CBO says we don't get back to pre-recession unemployment until 2016. So the idea that some of these projects are still coming online, I think, is a very good thing. Well, uh, and, and in line with that, I mean, where Mr. Brill uh, talked about how, you know, it takes a while for government spending to actually get into the, into the system. 
uh, would you say that if the government were to plan uh, a massive rebuilding of America's infrastructure beginning, let's say, this year, with the, with the aim at putting Americans back to work, would, would you think that that uh, kind of an approach, which would parallel what happened during the uh, uh, New Deal with the WPA, that that kind of an approach would benefit the economy, would stimulate the economy, would prime the pump of the economy and able to get people back to work? Yes. I think it would be very good in the short term, and then I think it would add to productivity growth even in the long term and make us grow faster even when the recession is over. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, you know, I think, I, think, I think one of the things that we can do with, uh, in our collaboration on this subcommittee is to, uh, is to bring people together to find out how we can create jobs and get America back to work. And, and I, I look forward to working with you in that. I thank the witnesses. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. We now yield to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Burkle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for being here this morning. A um, couple of questions. Uh, sort of out of context. First of all, Mr. Brill, you talked about um, the, the, the slowness at which the money was spent. And I wondered if you had any ideas as to why it, it happened that way. And then beyond that, and this is to anyone on the panel, is there a way to know how much stimulus money remains unspent at this time? Uh, thank you. Um, I think that there are a number of reasons that large amounts of the money remain unspent. Um, just as a point of reference, um, the CBO estimated uh, last month that in the current fiscal year, fiscal year 2011, um, there will be $148 billion in stimulus fu funding. And over the remaining years of the budget window, there will be another $148 billion in fiscal stimulus spending. Um, the reasons for the delays, I think, are numerous. It uh, depends uh, likely agency by agency or department by department. Um, many of these programs um, are, are, are large, complex building projects um, where simply um, to get the project uh, designed and approved, put online, um, uh, permitting the requirements that were necessary, environmental assessments that were necessary in order for certain construction projects to begin. Um, uh, takes a lot of time. Um, there are some projects that are in the midst of being completed, um, in essence, uh, bridges half built, um, and there are uh, certainly billions of dollars of other projects that have not yet even begun. And so your estimate for the amount right now that is unspent of the stimulus money? Um, beyond the current fiscal year is $148 billion and, uh, to be spent in this current year. Um, an additional $148 billion. So some of that $148 is we're midway into the fiscal year. So I'd, I'd ballpark it at about $200 billion in unspent dollars. Thank you. Does anyone else have a comment regarding any estimate unspent stimulus monies? Uh, Dr. Bivens, my question to you, um, we've heard several times throughout the course of the morning that perhaps the stimulus uh, the amount of the stimulus wasn't enough, and that was the reason why we did not see the robust economic recovery that we had hoped for. And I'm, my question to you is, if, if the intention was to keep unemployment, say, at 6 or 7 percent, what would that amount, what should the amount of the stimulus been? What, what could we have spent uh, to, to achieve that, that rate of unemployment? To achieve that rate of unemployment? Um, it may have been impossible to ever keep unemployment going above 7 percent, given the quickness and the severity of the, the shock from the housing bubble. That said, I think the economy could have easily absorbed a stimulus package almost twice as big, say $1.5 trillion, without running into the remotest risk of, say, overheating the economy or providing too much support or doing anything like sparking higher inflation or high interest rates, which is supposed to be the downsides of doing too much fiscal support. We could have had a stimulus package twice as big and not even flirted with any of those troubles. Can I make a comment on that? I mean, one of the problems I, I see with this, this sort of the Keynesian stimulus approach is that, um, you know, economists like, you know, Mark Zandi and others, they say, oh, we, you know, I supported this big stimulus and it has got the, you know, it has got the government uh, much deeper into debt, which is going to create this giant uh, burden in the future on uh, young people. At the same time, people like Mr. Zandi are saying, oh, we need a, uh, you know, we need a plan to reduce, uh, you know, spending and get these deficits under control. We need a credible plan to reduce these 
deficits. If you are a Keynesian economist, you can never have a credible plan to reduce mm -hmm. deficits because we might have a recession again in 2013 or 2014. And what would Mr. Zandi want? He would want another trillion dollar uh, stimulus. You can go on this endless cycle of stimulus, stimulus, stimulus. And I think it is a complete dead end. I think there is a giant moral judgment being made that for some reason Congress thought uh, that uh, you know, boosting, goosing people's income and consumption now during this recession was, uh, was a lot more valuable than the damage and harm that is going to be done by young people with this heavy uh, burden of taxes and deadweight losses and interest payments that they are going to have to uh, 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 bear. So a short-term goose for long-term pain, I don't think that Congress should be in the business of making that sort of value judgment. Thank you very much. I yield back. Thank, uh, thank the gentleman. Lady. Will you yield to the gentleman from uh, Idaho, Mr. Labrador, or recognize him? Mr. Bush, um, do you, I, we keep hearing about there is this consensus among the forecasters. Do you agree with Dr. Bivens that there is a consensus among the forecasters that the stimulus had a net positive effect? In your opinion, were financial markets aided by the stimulus? Uh, right. I think there is a consensus among Keynesian economic economists that, that it had an impact. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out, uh, and I'm sorry I screwed up my testimony, but one of the things I would like to see, if, if we are to believe Romer's you know, model and the way that they formulated it, why don't we extend it further and look at her research that she did on taxes? Because if you look at the stimulus bill and you say, well, we spend $800 billion, that's great, it does this and this and this, but you don't tell the whole story, because that money has to come from someplace. And if we use Romer's research, right, and we say, you know, let's say the United States borrows 40 cents on every dollar. So that means of $800 billion, you're looking at borrowing of $280 billion. And if it's a negative 3 to 1, you're back to $600 billion, and you're only going to use $200 billion of the $800 billion as any kind of stimulus. And I would love to see that in bills put forward into Congress. Anytime you're looking at spending, have the effect of you know, how much you're going to borrow to pay for this mm. and what the downside effect in taxes are going to be. Because I think that would really um, focus and clarify uh, for a lot of the members the impacts. So I would disagree. I mean, you know, again, with the Keynesians, that's what they, they argue. Um, they only fail because we didn't spend enough. Um, the financial markets looked at it this way that um, way more than what Congress did. Uh, there were beneficial effects from what the Federal Reserve did on a short-term basis. Um, but both what Congress has done and what the Federal Reserve have done come with costs. Uh, Congress obviously has to find a way to pay for what they did. Um, the Federal Reserve will find a cost in inflation very soon, if not already, uh, by what they are doing. Mr. Braille, do you have any comments about that? Um, I would I would just add the fact that um, it, that the argument that put forth um, in the the but for case um, is, is 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 a tricky one um, and it's a, it's actually a tricky one on on both sides. Um, I, I I think that we shouldn't over um, we shouldn't have too high expectations for economists to be good fortune tellers, especially at turning points in the economy. Um, but the lesson from that, uh, I think, is that Congress needs to be wary. Um, and so uh, we live in a world of where there are business cycles, and there will be uh, a recovery, and there will be a future recession. And when we come to the next point where um, economists are concerned about oh, the economy, and it seems that we are in recession, uh, there will be calls again uh, for fiscal stimulus. But we should keep in mind that it is difficult to predict what the future course of the economy is going to be. And therefore, it is difficult for Congress to craft policies, um, both to envision the right policy as well as for the uh, uh, executive branch to execute on those policies. And that, um, as was discussed in the previous panel, um, stable fiscal policy, policies that have uh, low tax rates, low marginal tax rates, um, and um, stable low spending rates, not policies that, that have huge ballooning deficits like the ones we face, are the ones that are likely to minimize the business cycle risks that we face. Dr. Bivens, is, is there a moment where 
where we're spending too much? Because, I mean, you're saying, uh, I was really surprised to hear that unemployment insurance and food stamp actually creates jobs. I mean, that's, uh, that to me was uh, uh, pretty incredible to hear. Is there a moment that we spend too much money on these things? Or, because it, I, I think if we're spending $100 billion, if we create so many jobs, why not spend $1 trillion? Why not spend $5 trillion? If, if spending government money is creating jobs, then let's, let's spend it all. Well, that is pretty easy. I mean, you, you reach the limit when you run the risk of overheating the economy by sparking inflation or high interest rates. I mean, that is the textbook case for macroeconomics. You provide fiscal support until you run the risk of overheating the economy in that way. And we are in no danger of doing that. Core rates of inflation are at 60-year lows. Interest rates are at 60-year lows. I mean, we are just running into none of the danger signs of having done anything like too much. And so $5 trillion? Yes, I think that would be too much. I think in terms of the, the current political debate, we are in absolutely zero danger of doing too much and overheating the economy through too much fiscal support. Could I just make one quick comment sure. on that? It, Greece felt the same way at some point. Yeah. And I think that is really the, the issue, is at some point the financial markets aren't going to allow the United States to borrow indefinitely at the rates that they are. So if you try to expand and, again, expand budget deficits, at some point they are going to turn on you. And again, the United States is borrowing at exceptionally low interest rates, and that could change, as we have seen since November, when interest rates have gone up 100 basis points. Well, and, and if, you, if you, you, know, you question the Federal Reserve Chairman, he, will, he would indicate that they can pull back at the appropriate time. Um, I think that is a big if. Um, but that is the argument you hear, and I, I would assume Dr. Bibbins would, would say that, you know, but again, I think that's that's scary when you're looking at a handful of people who think they can out out guess and outperform and guess and, and have the right timing and beat the market and figure out ahead of. I, I just think that's a, a scary place to go. And so, um, I, I did want one last thing, if I could, um, Mr. Brill. You gave a 200 and some billion dollar figure. That the, the facts that we're getting or the numbers we're getting on on stimulus dollars that have not been spent are much less than that. I mean, we are hearing 92 percent of stimulus dollars are out the door. So is that number, is some, I assume some of those monies are already obligated dollars but haven't been out the door, but they are already in contract or whatever. Tell me where you are getting that number, if you would, real quickly. Yeah, sure, exactly. The, the difference being the um, allocated funds versus uh, dollars spent. Okay. Um, so the government has successfully decided what to do with most of the money uh, two years after enactment. But um, hasn't written the check. But hasn't actually written the check. Okay. I want to thank the, uh, the, the witnesses uh, for your insight and appreciate you spending some time.